This video introduces Rondo form. First, we'll discuss Rondo types and characteristics. Then we'll look at two examples. The first is by Francois Couperin. We'll be looking at the Quatrième Concert for Lan movement. So this is the last movement, and it's named after a type of Italian folk dance. Our other example is Robert Schumann's During on Meinem Finger, which is from Frauenliebe und Leben, his Opus 42 song cycle. So what is rondo form? Rondo form is a form that alternates refrains and episodes. So essentially it's a very modular form that's built from two types of parts. First we'll look at the refrain. This is the recurring main theme of the movement. Usually the refrain is stated in the tonic key each time it comes back, not just the first and last time. There are exceptions, but the expectation going in is that the refrain will be in tonic every time it comes back. It's possible for the refrain to be modified. The most common modification, especially if you're dealing with a very long movement, is for the refrain to be shortened in one or more of the restatements. There are other reasons that might involve changing the tonal trajectory of all or part of it, or adding material, or adding some embellishment, those sorts of things. Episodes contrast the refrain in key, theme, or both of those parameters. So either key or theme are sufficient by themselves to dis differentiate an episode from the refrain, but it's also possible for both the key and the theme to be working together. Sometimes an episode is called a couplet. This is particularly common when dealing with the Baroque rondeau. This is partially because couplet refers to small scale pieces in which the individual sections might be only one or two phrases, especially if it's two phrases, the word couplet makes a lot of sense. Next, let's look at common rondo types. So the rondo, as I just mentioned, is a Baroque form. These tend to be built from very short subsections, but there are many of those subsections that are concatenated together. So these sorts of pieces may have many, many refrains and episodes. And these pieces are likely to have one or more episodes in the tonic key. If you think about it, that makes sense. A lot of Baroque music spends a lot of time in the tonic key, especially if you're thinking about the Baroque suite, where the individual movements of that suite happen to all share this tonic. Next up is the five-part rondo. So in rondos proper, they're, they're named after the number of main sections they have. And in this context, main sections means the number of refrains plus the number of episodes. So in a five-part rondo, there are three refrains and two episodes. What I've shown here schematically is the most typical type of five-part rondo, where the, the three refrains are all in tonic. All of them have the same thematic material. And the two episodes are in closely related keys, and those two episodes are distinct from one another thematically, which is why I've represented them with capital B and capital C. Now, there are possible variants on this scheme. For example, the episodes don't have to be in closely related keys. That's just what happens most of the time. So for example, they could just be in the tonic key, or they could be in the parallel key, or they could be in some other distantly related key. There are options, but this is the most prototypical structure. Next up are some of our longer rondo forms. So first is the seven part asymmetrical rondo. In this case, there are four refrains and three episodes. Notice that each of those three episodes is distinct from one another thematically, and oftentimes they will be in different keys. Now, again, they don't have to be, and they don't have to necessarily be in closely related keys. That's just what happens most of the time. Then finally is the seven part symmetrical rondo. Now, comparing the seven-part asymmetrical rondo to the seven-part symmetrical rondo, the main difference involves what happens in episode three. So looking at the asymmetrical rondo, as I mentioned a minute ago, episode one and episode three have distinct thematic material. In a seven-part symmetrical rondo, episode one and episode three share the same thematic material, more or less. The difference is not in the theme, but in the harmonic structure. So the first episode is nearly always in some sort of closely related key, so some non-tonic key, basically, whereas episode three will be in tonic. What this does is, in addition to creating a balance between the first part of the rondo form and the last part of the rondo form in terms of themes, it also creates this nice long stretch at the end of the form that is completely in tonic. So notice that we've got two refrains and that third episode that are creating this long stretch in the tonic key, thus providing even greater emphasis on the tonal resolution of the piece. There are a few ways to commonly expand a rondo. 
Transitions are common, so looking at sections that are connecting, say, a refrain to an episode. Retransitions are really common, as these tend to be very long and elaborate, more elaborate than you see in a lot of other types of pieces, actually. And it makes a lot of sense, because if you have a form that's built on this thing that keeps coming back, teasing the listener regarding how long you're going to wait until that thing comes back as part of the fun of these sort of pieces. So retransitions are a way of heightening the anticipation for the refrain to return. And as is the case with a lot of other types of pieces, it's possible for rondos to have an elaborate coda or a mo more modest codetta. Instrumental rondos often have fairly long codas. All three of these types of expansions are particularly common in the classical era moving forward in music history. You won't find these sorts of things nearly as often in, say, Baroque music, for example. So, where are you likely to find a rondo? Most rondos appear as finale movements. In fact, rondo is one of the three most common options for the last movement in a multi-movement work. So things like symphonies or sonatas or string quartets or piano trios, all those sort of standard classical and romantic multi-movement pieces often have a rondo as the last movement. The other two options that are very common for last movements, if you're curious, are sonata form and sonata rondo form. When talking about concertos in particular, the finale of a concerto is almost always a rondo. It is considered default, and if you know the repertoire, if you go listen to some of the repertoire at all, you'll see that this is the case. So there are other possibilities where you might find rondos. They just happen to appear in the repertoire with less frequency. So for example, some slow movements are in rondo form, some single movement works are in rondo form. In this case, usually the piece would actually be titled rondo. And some songs actually are in rondo form as well. Next up is our first example. So let's take a look at Couperin's Quatrième Concert, the finale movement from this. So again, this is following in the tradition of finale movements are often in rondo forms. What we have here on the screen right now is the refrain section by itself. In the Baroque era, paper was much more expensive, relatively speaking, than it is nowadays. So copyists and composers would be very careful about how much space something was taking on the page. Knowing that helps the layout of the full score of this piece make a little bit more sense. So the Rondo theme is only written once, since it's repeated so many times. There are a system of symbols that tell the performer to keep going back to this section and playing it. So in total, this refrain occurs five times over the course of the piece. This section has two phrases. The first phrase ends with an IAC, the second phrase ends with a PAC. So this passage by itself happens to be a parallel sectional period, which is then repeated via the repeat signs. Later sections of this piece are not all periods as well, but it does point out the fact that a lot of the sections in this piece are built from pairs of phrases. Another element this refrain introduces is a dotted rhythm, a very characteristic dotted rhythm for 6-8. This particular rhythm features prominently in some of the later couplets. In particular, many of the later recurrences appear either as a passing motion, so connecting two chord members with a, the short note serving as a passing tone between them, or similarly with the short note featuring as a neighbor note. Both of these elements feature prominently in the later couplets which we will now discuss. So the first couplet, like the refrain, is an E major, the tonic key. It has two cadences, and really it's just one phrase that's repeated. So both of the phrases end in IACs. This particular couplet features dotted neighbor figures. The second couplet is the first to venture outside of the tonic key. It begins in C sharp minor, so the submediate key in relation to tonic E major. It does confirm that key with a cadence, a PAC to be precise, but by the end of the couplet, the passage has modulated back to E major, ending with a half cadence and heightening anticipation for the return of the refrain that would be played immediately after this. This particular couplet emphasizes a lot of dotted passing figures. The third couplet is by far the longest out of the four in this piece. This one is another one that stays in the tonic key throughout with multiple perfect authentic cadences and one half cadence in the middle. This one kind of mixes both the neighbor and the passing figures that featured prominently in the previous couplets. 
And last but not least is the fourth couplet. This one switches to the tonic minor, so the parallel key in relation to E major, confirming that with perfect authentic cadences. And this one does not have any dotted rhythms. It's the only section of the piece where they drop out entirely. Instead, this particular couplet features just straight eighth notes throughout, though it does include both neighboring figures and leaps that are drawn motivically from the refrain. So to zoom out to the entire piece for a moment, this piece has a total of five statements of the refrain. All of those refrain statements are exactly identical, unless the performers are adding ornamentation, as would be characteristic of the style. And interspersed among those refrain statements are the four couplets. The first and the third couplets are in tonic. The second and the fourth couplets add just a little bit of contrast, with the second one being the only one that actually manages to change the tonic pitch, and the fourth couplet um, changing the mode for a bit. So in total, this is a nine part rondo. It's very much a rondo due to the style and the small sections and the interleaving of parts in this Baroque form. And it's nine parts because there are five refrains and four couplets. Next up is Frauenliebe und Leben. So this is a poetry cycle by Aldebert von Camiso, and this is most famously set by Robert Schumann as his Opus 42. There are other musical settings of this song cycle, though. So the title translates to Women's Love and Life. So over the course of the entire eight-song cycle, it traces one particular woman courting and marrying and then having a child with someone and then eventually mourning the death of her husband and kind of dealing with the emotional aftermath of that. So it basically covers the entire relationship between this particular woman and her husband. The song that we'll be looking at in particular is the fourth in the set called Du Ring on Meinem Finger. So basically it, it literally translates to ring on my finger. And the do is signifying that she's actually talking to the ring itself. So this, this is her singing about and to her engagement ring and what it represents in the course of the relationship. The translation here is by S.S. Prower from the Penguin Book of Leader, as you can see in the citation. All right, so looking at what we just have here structurally, this particular poem has five stanzas, as is typical for the layout of poetry. Notice that each stanza is separated by a line. Looking a little bit more closely, there's some repetition here. The first and the last stanzas are identical, and the third stanza, the one in the middle, starts with the same phrase as the outer two do. So, du ring on meinem finger is a little is emphasized throughout this. Now let's look at the rhyme scheme. So the first quatrain here has an ABCB rhyme. So basically it's a typical quatrain in which the, the second and the fourth lines are rhyming with one another. And that pattern basically holds throughout the rest of the poem. The only exception is in stanza four, where the first and the third lines rhyme with each other in addition to the second and the fourth lines rhyming. Now let's look at the focus of each of the stanzas in terms of time. The first stanza focuses on the present, where she's actually talking to her ring. The second one is kind of dealing with what this ring represents in relation to her past. Similarly, carrying into the, the third stanza, this emphasis on what has happened, what has already come to completion. In contrast, the fourth stanza is the only one that focuses on the future, and this one seems to be the most animated, just even in terms of the raw language here. And then, of course, the fifth stanza is identical to the first, so it's also focusing on the present. With all of that in mind, many of Schumann's musical choices make a lot of sense. Given the structure of the poetry itself, it makes sense that he chose a rondo form for this, specifically one in which uses stanza one, stanza three, and stanza five as the text that's set in the refrain sections. And the two intervening ones are set musically as episodes. Let's take a closer look at the refrain statements. So there are three statements of the refrain, and as I just said, they feature stanza one, stanza three, and stanza five, respectively. 
So the beginnings and pretty much most of the middle of the refrain are differ only in slight details, like the pickup notes. Otherwise, the three track one another pretty closely for the first two thirds or so of the refrain. So the end of the last refrain is slightly modified. So let's take a look first at how the first refrain ends. The piece as a whole is an E flat major, but the very end of the first refrain temporarily modulates to the dominant key, cadencing in the key of B flat major. The second refrain is identical to the first refrain except for the different text that's being set. In contrast, both the harmony and the melody of the third refrain have been revised to end with an authentic cadence and tonic. This makes sense, again, because as the piece is drawing to a close, this is the vocalist's last statement in the piece, and it makes sense for this to be modified to end with a more conclusive cadence in the tonic key. Now let's take a look at the episodes. The first episode establishes a different theme, but it never really gets out of E flat major and it has the same style and dynamic as the refrain. Episode two is the most different part of the entire song. This section is much faster, it's much louder, the melodic contour goes much higher. You can't quite see it from this short excerpt that I put here, but this eventually leads to the melodic climax and the highest note for the singer in the piece. This passage is also much more chromatic than the other sections, even though the entire thing can be explained in E flat major, there are long stretches where it, it seems to do everything in its power to avoid the E flat major as a triad. Um, there are many secondary dominants throughout that sort of destabilize this passage and provide interesting contrast. So here's an overview of the entire piece. Notice that it features our three refrains interleaved with the two episodes. And this diagram also shows that this song ends with a short codetta. This diagram also shows how pretty much all of the sections start in E flat, two of the refrains dip temporarily into B flat major, but this one has a high degree of harmonic cohesion in terms of key area. Thematically, this can be represented as A, B, A, C, A prime. Again, the prime is just representing the fact that the last refrain has been slightly modified in relation to the earlier ones, making this song a good example of a five-part rondo. So the only thing that's a little less than typical about this song is that the two episodes stay in tonic as opposed to venturing into closely related keys or, or more adventurous key relations. But otherwise, the sections and the layout are pretty clear. This particular rondo did not feature any transitions or retransitions, but it does have a brief codetta at the end. To summarize, rondos alternate refrains, which are the main theme, and episodes, which are the contrasting sections. And it's both the fun of delaying the recurrence of the main theme and also the interest created by the contrasting episodes that together form the joy and the excitement of these sort of pieces. We looked at two examples. The Kukran selection was an example of a nine-part rondo, and the Schumann song is a good example of a five-part rondo.